The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Want the high stakes stuff? The believe the hype stuff? The criminally good, emotional roller coaster, can't believe what you're seeing stuff? You know, the good stuff. AMC Plus has it all. Can't wait for the beginning of the end? Watch all new episodes of The Walking Dead one week early. Want to be chilled to the core? Set sail with the North Water, a thrilling Arctic drama starring Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell. Plus, uncover gripping true crime content ad free and on demand. Expect the epic with AMC Plus. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus. Only the good stuff. You know, consider how Americans thought about war, their wars, you know, for a long time. They were fans of them. Vietnam changed that and kind of introduced a kind of, like, disquietude about the role Americans play in the world. Furthermore, World War II, which had been the good war and still is, you know, we remember less because it was an American victory as because the Holocaust happened even so. And that kind of sensitized a lot of elites to thinking that war's not kind of for taking victory laps. It's when terrible things happen, even when we fight it. And I think without that sense of the worst thing that can happen in war, you know, civilian depredation, the death of the innocent, previously cavalierly dismissed by generations of Americans, but embraced as like something morally significant in the 1960s through 80s. We really can't understand how tech and the law ended up leading in the direction that they have. I'm Ian Enright. And this is the Lawfare Podcast for September 8th, 2021. Jack Goldsmith sat down with Samuel Moyne, Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence and Professor of History at Yale University. The two discussed Professor Moyne's latest book, Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. The conversation touched on the changing nature of war, the decoupling of conflict from our national conversations, and even Tolstoy. Humane is out now in bookstores. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 8th, Humane, with Samuel Moyne. So, Sam, the subtitle of your book is How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. And we'll get to that, but your first chapter is about the great Russian writer Leo Tolstoy, who's, I think it's fair to say that his views on humane war influenced you and you try to resurrect that view and extend it. So I don't know if that's right or not. Could you tell us what Tolstoy is doing in your first chapter and how it relates to the book? Sure. So Leo Tolstoy, you know, was there at at present at the creation of uh, what we now call international humanitarian law, the, the noble goal of kind of minimizing suffering through international law in you know, something that most people think can't be regulated, you know, violence on a grand scale. And at first, he is not sure that we should kind of engage in this regulation at all, because he thinks that it conceals the the underlying morality of war. So in War and Peace, he has one of his most famous characters, Prince Andrei, say, we should should just not regulate war so that people know what it is and only fight it when when it's really important. Now, I think he gave up that view as as time passed. He wasn't yet kind of a a pacifist when he wrote War and Peace. But when he became one, I think he came up with some subtler views about the risks in making war more humane. And I I think he identified two of great importance and his worries kind of became applicable long after his lifetime. I think principally thanks to one of our recent presidents, Barack Obama, and what he did to the war on terror. So the first worry was that, you know, if we if we work 
on making an evil practice like slavery or war more humane will give up the goal of of keeping those things from happening at all. And he he saw that advocates are especially susceptible to the temptation to compromise with evil and instead kind of make it a little less cruel. And then Tolstoy looked at a second risk, which had to do with the audience. And he said, look at how people demand their food, the animals they eat to be slaughtered more humanely, and then think they're good people, even though they then go on to eat more. And the argument there is is a little different. It's about bad faith, the way in which we might take the fact that we can successfully humanize war as like tantamount to thinking that the war we're supporting that our country's engaged in is, you know, morally good enough. And for both of these reasons, Tolstoy said, we should be aware of the risks that come with humanizing things. They could entrench something we ought to kind of expose and hate. And I think, though he was wrong for a really long time about war, it became possible in the latter stages of America's war on terror for his worries to kind of come online. And it's because they haunted me, and I think they ought to haunt Americans, that I decided to give Tolstoy so much attention at the start. When you say he was wrong about war, I think you said he was wrong about war until recently. You mean that this idea that making war extremely humane would commit the related evils that you just talked about. That didn't occur until much later. Is that what you mean? So I mean a couple of things. So in his early stage, he said, let's just leave war unregulated so we know what we're dealing with. And he actually then embraced brutal war. And he thought, well, if if we embrace brutality, then we'll just have less frequent war or the wars we have will last, you know, won't last as long. Now, that's clearly insane, even though, you know, the stock response to my arguments tends to be that, well, if you're not for humane war, you must be for brutal war. But then I think Tolstoy made like a second kind of mistake in his later career, and it was just to to kind of be too early. So he addressed the first Geneva Convention, which tried to limit suffering through international law of soldiers left to bleed out on the battlefield. And that treaty, as we know, arranged for private citizens to go out and help those who were dying and maybe save them. And he overgeneralized because it turns out when we look at the history of the laws of war, they're not about making war more humane for a really long time. They're about, you know, brutality and intense intense violence. So that shouldn't be surprising since states make international law and states got international law that allowed them to do what they wanted. But then something interesting happened in, I think, the middle of the Cold War, when for a variety of reasons, the laws of war did become more humane in content. And when they did, Tolstoy's worries became more applicable than they had been before. Okay, I want to get to that and and ask you some questions about the middle of the Cold War, the 1970s, when you think that switch occurred. But can we just sketch what happened in the interim? I mean, your book talks about, I'll put it in my words and you can correct me, you know, basically a fight between people who believed that we should focus on stopping war in the first place on the one side and on the other side, people who focused on making war humane. So I I think it's fair to say that at least in legal instruments, again, correct me if I'm wrong, when you think about Kellogg-Briand and then especially the UN Charter, the focus was on trying to regulate the beginning of war, at least as a legal matter. I don't know if you agree with that, but trace out what happened between Tolstoy and the 1970s, as you see it, on these two fronts. So obviously a lot happened. You're you're right that I focus on the debate about how to bring peace, whether or not kind of the anxieties that humanizing war would postpone peace were applicable. 
a lot of folks, at least across the Atlantic, dealing with wars of whites against one another were really concerned to bring peace. And that's because, you know, it was a new kind of society, a post-feudal society. And actually, I try to show that, you know, women, you know, concerned in new ways about losing their, you know, husbands, sons, and brothers kind of led a charge, you know, even long before World War I, but especially in between World War I and II, to get statesmen to at least agree to some kind of limit on war. And of course, we have that formally through, you know, depends on, you know, what book you read, the the Kellogg-Briand Pact or the UN Charter or the post-colonial era with the Declaration on Friendly Relations. What, what I want to show first is that Americans were very deeply involved in that project. There were lots of Tolstoyans in particular, but far more who prioritized peace when the idea of humane war was not something especially appealing to Americans. Now, part of the reason is that Americans hadn't pivoted to world hegemony. And so a big part of the book is about what's at stake when a country that has, has had some distinction in the kind of transatlantic quest for peace ends up embracing war, not for peace, but for the sake of freedom first against, you know, the Axis, and then uh, even more in the Cold War against the, the Soviet Union. And I, I guess at, it's at that point, as I see it, that Americans spurned peace that, you know, you could say was at least part of their birthright for all of their, you know, killing of Indians and imperialism in the Philippines and, you know, hijinks, you know, south of the border in the 19th century and early 20th. And so what interests me is kind of how that that switch then gets affected in the middle of the Cold War, because with the rise of air war, with what happens over Japan in World War II, with what happens in Korea a few years later, what happens in Vietnam, I really don't see Americans front-loading humanity and warfare, just the reverse. And that's because the law that they're helping craft is so permissive, so inapplicable, especially when they face non-white enemies. And so something happens after that. And so I really want to use the first half of the book to set up a before, uh, just to illustrate how different war was, how different the law was before something really interesting happens. So that something interesting happened in the 1970s. And you have some surprising things to say. Well, tell us what happened in the 70s. Is that fair that this happened in the 70s? That's that's right. It seems to me that we can date kind of a, a real culture of humanizing war for Americans, maybe more generally to, you know, the 1970s. It's it really doesn't it doesn't seem there in the American equation before that date. And so it's a challenge to explain how you get this mutation. So there are a lot of factors. I'll just mention a few. I think first and foremost is kind of external. There are a lot of new states and there are states that have been brutalized by the brutal war of America and Europeans before them in centuries of, of global empire. Now, it's not like making war humane is their main goal, but they're aware, these new post-colonial states, that the hierarchy of wealth and power is still there and the likelihood of intervention looms even in a post-colonial world and they were right. And so they try to kind of make the laws of war more humane than they had been, notably in these additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions. Europeans, meanwhile, have given up empire and are under, you know, the American security blanket. And they begin in so many ways posing as, let's say, the moralists of our world. And so they're on board with humane war, not fighting war at all anymore, with a few exceptions. And so they join. So the really interesting thing is, why do Americans permit it? Since, you know, they're concerned in, in large part that the, the communists of the time, the Soviet Union and its satellites are making hay of all the kind of global violence that America has been perpetrating. That hasn't posed a big challenge for America in the past, but in the 1970s, 
they act. And I, I see a few different kind of actors in in the mix. One is this, the state. And I try to show that Americans, uh, in spite of some kind of early neocon opposition, they go to Geneva. They care about updating the laws of war. And I present evidence that kind of the, the lawyers who work for the United States think it's crucial that America be part of the humanization of war, having sullied its global reputation in Vietnam. And indeed, the military within the American state is to a surprising extent, you know, not totally, but to a surprising extent and more and more over time on board with the idea that the reputational hit that the military has taken because of me lie, especially means that it has to, to, to join in a, an emerging consensus that war has to be fought humanely under the law. Now, of course, Americans, both in the state and the military are going to, you know, reserve the right to interpret the new rules their own way, but it's really significant that, all these global factors are leading to a more humane form of, of international law. Indeed, it gets branded international humanitarian law and the American state and its military on board. Finally, I'd mention humanitarians. You know, the, the biggest movements around war involving Americans back to the 19th century had been anti-war movements. The Cold War gave those a bit of a bad name. But they surged again amongst activists in the Vietnam era. But then they cratered for reasons we can get into if you want. George McGovern yeah. lost in, a, in, in really what was a devastating event for the cause of peace, I think, even down to this day. And as the anti-war energy waned, you get new groups that decide that they will pursue this, let's say, lesser cause of making war more humane, pressuring the state and the military uh, to be more humane than they have and agreeing to, let's say, bicker over what's going to count as a, enough humanity. So, for example, Human Rights Watch starts monitoring state compliance globally, but in also the United States with international humanitarian law in the 80s. And this is part of that kind of big mutation with fewer and fewer anti-war activists, more and more humanitarian activists. So you think this is a crucial point. This is the point at which war starts to become seriously humanized. There become, I think it's fair to say, serious use and bellow type restraints on war. And your thesis is that this move is what made war easier to sustain, easier to conduct over time, that this move also suppressed the moral costs of conducting war. And we'll get to that. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my question for now is, did anyone in the 70s that was advocating for this move, was this just a, a self-defeating implication of an effort to achieve good ends? Or did some of these actors think this is going to be good for war and extending? For example, what was the DOD position on, did, did people in DOD think this is going to make it easier for us to sustain our credibility and legitimacy in fighting wars? Or was this, all of this just a self-defeating, sort of an accidental consequence of this move? So I, I think actually it's the U.S. military that is clearest. And I cite evidence to the effect that some of them say that to make war sustainable in a post-Vietnam atmosphere, it, it's necessary to accept constraint. Now, you know, it's it's a kind of interesting fact that if we're looking at the officer corps after Vietnam, the principal lesson it's supposed to have learned with Colin Powell's doctrine and so forth is that you don't go to war unless you can win and get out. But, you know, whatever the force of that lesson, it ended up being thrown overboard in the war on terror. And a lot of wars were lost by the U.S. military in, in the last couple of decades. But this lesson that it, it should avoid getting tarnished again by the immorality of its conduct, I believe stuck. And I think it wasn't universal, but even in the first days after 9-11, when the neocons, George W. Bush and his lawyers are trying to lift 
the constraints of the use in bellow or the, the law governing the conduct of hostilities. You get pushback, not just from the Department of State, but also from the Department of Defense. Still, I, I want to concede that in the 70s, there are some elements of a perfect storm getting kind of set up. It's impossible to anticipate then. And I'm not claiming that people should have been more clear-eyed, in part because I think that humane war in general is good. The question is whether there are risks we can now learn about from what's happened, whether there's kind of the contingent possibility that the humanizing of war can work in a way that we now know it can because we've lived it, that it can help entrench forever wars and indeed kind of help legitimate wars, not just constrain their conduct. And so I'm Monday morning quarterbacking. I'm not at all claiming that anyone could foresee this, except, of course, Leo Tolstoy at the very beginning. One more question about the 1970s before we get to kind of the meat of of the book and the post 9-11 world. What is the relationship between this book and your famous book, The Last Utopia, Human Rights and History? That book was a contrarian take about the origins and limitations of the modern human rights movement. At least that's the way I took it. Both that book also found an important pivot point for human rights in the 1970s. That book also talked about the self-defeating effects and maybe the the not so obvious aims and consequences of the human rights movement. How do these two books, and I may have botched that, so you can correct me, but how do the two books relate to one another? So I wrote them both. Uh, and there are even other similarities. They're both contrary, and they're, they're both fundamentally interrogations of liberal morality. And they both pivot on some developments in the 1970s. There are big differences. First and foremost is that the last utopia kind of ends in the 1970s, whereas I really aspire in this book to talk about the intervening period and you know, this is a war on terror book. So a full fourth of it is about the year since September 11th, 2001. Uh, And it ends with not just Obama, but Donald Trump. And I think I can extend it even to the current president. Actually, there was very little law in, in any of my work, but in the last utopia, aside from noting that International lawyers didn't seem in the United States didn't seem to care about human rights very much until the 1970s, and then they started. But this is is a book not about let's say the morality and and politics of human rights, but of a very specific legal agenda and the the kind of the role it plays. Finally, I think my argument's different. So the argument of the last utopia is that human rights were, let's say, insufficient and foreclosed better possibilities. I think that's true of the laws of war for all of their its virtues, but I actually want to claim that we should worry, as Tolstoy did, that the laws of war actually promote some evil alongside the obvious good with which we associate them. Okay, let's move on to the, let's get to the post 9-11 world. The book is it's an intellectual history of these ideas. You tell the book through stories. You tell the book through stories of individuals who were involved in peace movements, who were advocates, who were in the government, who were critical of the government. I make a role, uh, an appearance in that regard in the Bush administration. And to me, that those elements of the book suggest that these individual choices that people made in these, in these contexts, you had an excerpt of the book in the New York Review of Books from the chapter on Michael Ratner, the famous human rights litigator, who for the longest time spent his litigation life litigating against the possibility of going to war and then kind of switched to focus on the humane aspects of war after 9-11. So I just want to see, I want to give a, a counter or at least a tangential explanation for the undoubted humanization of war. And I think it was inevitable. I just, and I, I want to claim that it was an inevitable and it was the inevitable outcome of two larger trends. One is this long-term secular legalization of everything, not just of the military, but of all of national security, which it certainly got a big boost in the seventies and eighties, but it has long antecedents. And it was not just in war and national security, but it was just whatever the reason, 
law took over everything over the course of the 20th century and became an integral aspect of government in a way that it wasn't before. And then technology changed things. Technology made possible both pinpoint strikes. You don't have to do drones. I mean, really, the model that you're talking about of what happened after 9-11 was a continuous threat model that really got going, as you talk about in some respects, before 9-11 with cruise missiles in Sudan in 1998, in Afghanistan in 1998 by Clinton, the Libya attacks in 1986, the planned targeted killing and rendition of bin Laden. And then most importantly, you talk about the Kosovo uh, episode where we used very, I think, first time in a kind of public way, pinpoint strikes. There was serious attention to the so-called CNN effect. All of these factors, both the legalization, the the sort of long-term generic legalization, the rise of technology that makes possible these pinpoint strikes, the rise of technology which allows every element of military action to be photographed, recorded, and shown around the world, and the rise of technology which empowers actors around the globe to threaten the United States in various ways. So I want to suggest that this humanization of war, this combination of fastidious attention to the laws of war combined with pinpoint technologies that kind of sanitizes war and makes it acceptable, that that was the inevitable consequence of these two factors. And and therefore, there's kind of nothing to fight against. What do you think? So I think those are two really important factors. And, you know, I, I actually narrate in the book how a few, you know, let's not go overboard, a few people at the dawn of air power thought it would play the role that drones end up playing in the humanization of war, namely enabling the precision that has to be the predicate of it. But I want to kind of frame this somewhat differently and add a third factor that I think is, is even bigger than the two you've mentioned. So first, you know, we'll get into this, but my book is really an account of let's call it the two wars on terror, because we had an immediate response to 9-11 that involved, you know, massive intervention with lots of troops. And a lot of the debates about war on terror kind of were were incidents of that kind of uh, intervention that's now, you know, over precisely two decades later. And then there's the second war on terror, which kind of emerged from and in response to the the first, and let's call it the shadow war. And I really want to suggest that this kind of shadow war is is not at all new in world history. You know, it, it was kind of a very familiar way of proceeding, especially in the history of, of kind of imperial rule in asymmetrical contests. But I think there is something new to our version of this, of this shadow war. And it's, there was kind of a new moral culture of humanity. Maybe it was made possible by tech. Um, Maybe the law became its kind of its vessel. But what we really need to care about is why people would want their shadow wars, which, you know, the wealthy and powerful have been fighting for centuries to look different, not just to be out of sight, but to be fought, you know, more humanely, even when they're out of sight. So there I focus um, not just on some of the factors we were talking about before, but on cultural change. You know, consider how Americans thought about war, their wars, you know, for a long time. They were fans of them. Vietnam changed that and kind of introduced a kind of like disquietude about the role Americans play in the world. Furthermore, World War II, which had been the good war and still is, you know, we remember less because it was an American victory as because the Holocaust happened even so. And that kind of sensitized a lot of elites to thinking that war is not kind of for taking victory laps. It's when terrible things happen, even when we fight it. And I think without that sense of the worst thing that can happen in war, you know, civilian depredation, the death of the innocent, 
previously cavalierly dismissed by generations of Americans, but embraced as like something morally significant in the 1960s through 80s. We really can't understand how tech and the law ended up leading in the direction that they have. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting for creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast, for the stories. You trust podcast hosts like me for a lot of things, for the content you consume, for the news, even for information about national security and law. But you shouldn't have to trust us about sleep, which impacts your life very directly. So if you're looking for ways to improve your sleep this fall, don't just take it from me. You should also trust the more than 2 million happy sleepers who are currently sleeping on a Nectar mattress. There are tens of thousands of reviews from real people who sleep on Nectar mattresses that you can read. Nectar is an incredible value for a quality product. A mattress this well-engineered and comfortable should cost hundreds of dollars more, but Nectar prices start at just $499. Join the more than 2 million happy sleepers who sleep on a Nectar with its award-winning layers of comfort and premium memory foam mattress that hugs your body and keeps you cool. Nectar is currently running its biggest offer ever, $399 in accessories, Visit Nectarsleep.com to get your new mattress today. You get a 365-night home trial, plus forever warranty, plus free shipping and returns. Shop from the convenience of your own home. Go to Nectarsleep.com. That's Nectarsleep.com. But I would have thought that the causation, if if that's what we'll call it, would be is exactly backwards. That... Mm-hmm. Our moral posture towards these things changed. For example, you know, you talk about two wars on terrorism, what I'll call the heavy, you call the second one the shadow war. I call the first one the heavy footprint war. Those are the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan and Iraq that Obama ran against. He came into office saying he was going to with, pull back on those. He did to some degree. But Obama, as you discuss in detail, doubled down on what I think of as the shadow war or war at a distance, or stealth warfare. And he did so in a way that played up in a, to a great effect, the sort of legal constraints and how close attention was paid to law. But it took advantage of these extraordinary technological developments that allowed us to have this moral stance, that, that allowed for pinpoint strikes, that allowed us to try to avoid uh, civilians and the like. And and the most important thing that Obama did, it seems to me, is to take the war out of the front page of the newspaper, to Mm -hmm. decouple it from democratic concern. So people can, you know, suddenly go about their lives and not have to think about the war. And he was able to continue the war, meeting threats that he thought were genuine without dealing with the political costs that Bush faced with, with his heavier, higher casualty, especially U.S. casualty war. And it seems to me that the morality adjusted because basically we weren't seeing the more anymore, that it just became a non-issue in domestic politics. Look, I think that's right as, as just like a general account of most Americans. You know, odd implies can. And if people, you know, think that American war ought to be fought more humanely than when we were leveling cities and, you know, firing indiscriminate weapons, it's, it's clearly, you know, pretty hypothetical until it's actually possible to strike with more precision. Still, I'm interested in at least a pretty big subset of Americans who go further. Because, you know, this was what Tolstoy said about animals. If the dying is taking place out of view, then why would we be concerned if it's cruel or not? But Obama didn't just take the war on terror off the front pages. He gave speeches about how important it was that he was bringing humanity to targeted killings. So for that audience, who knows how big, uh, placated by the assurance that though out of view, 
the drones weren't ever striking. Special forces don't ever kill, except uh, when there's no risk of collateral harm. You know, that has to be explained. And I think it's it's a moral development, you know, and what's more, given, you know, what we've learned about how erratic drones are, about how much blood collaterally is spilled anyway, it's not like ought implies can. Ought outran, preceded our ability to actually institutionalize this fully, although America did so to a remarkable extent. So I want to... I want you to be precise about what you think about Obama's move. I'll call it Obama's move. It was a trend that happened during the Bush administration that I think it's fair to say Obama really took to the next level and completed of humanizing war, of playing up legal constraints while at the same time taking the war off the front page of the paper, so to speak. I mean, is your view that that's a bad development or is your your view that that's a costly development? Dexter Felkins had a, a review in the New Yorker of your book when he said, in your desire for a better world, Moyne comes close to licensing carnage as if you don't like the fact that our force is more precise and that some cruelty has been taken out of war. Is that your claim? What is your precise stance towards the sort of cleansing of war? It's a great question. It's really the ultimate question and it's very difficult to answer satisfactorily. So I've written a book that it's about qualms, and I, I want to be very clear that you know the qualms I feel are kind of not felt by by everyone, and I think that I can defend them, but I don't want to claim that we're we're just dealing with people who don't have their own moral view of things. So let me just start by saying, if you think the sole alternative to humane war is brutal war, then we should choose humane war every day of the week and, you know, twice on Saturday or whatever the expression is. But that's the question, whether that's the choice. When I look out, it seems to me first that it's hard to deny that most of the heavy footprint war or the first version of the war on terror failed. And in fact, we've been extricating ourselves from it from, you know, during George W. Bush's presidency in a, a series of stages. The, the really burning question concerns the shadow war, the light and no footprint war of, of special forces and drones, which Obama didn't just uh, escalate, expand in space, extend in time, but formalize through these claims that it was humane and better than all available alternatives. So that's that's the challenging question. Was it? Because if it was better, then, you know, Obama wasn't a diabolical genius. He was just a genius. But I don't think so. So h- here's why. First, there's a kind of normative question. Apart from whether, you know, Americans have been saved from terror thanks to this shadow war. Do we want a world in which the great powers can, you know, exercise that power unrestrictedly through this, the kind of, you know, surveillance and when necessary, killing that the shadow war still involves? You know, second, even if you you don't want to ask that normative question, you know, which is, you know, to me, the answer is very clear that it's chilling and outrageous. Then you should ask the more kind of pragmatic question. Does this work? Well, now in other moods, Obama, we know from the famous Jeffrey Goldberg interview, wanted to get rid of the war on terror, thought that terrorism should be treated as a boring regulatory quandary, uh, not something that forces us to arm America to the teeth uh, engage in the extraordinary expense of doing so, kill when experts deem it necessary, even at the price of creating new terrorists. And so I, I really want to, you know, kind of bring the shadow war a little bit into the, the kind of front of the stage and get us to look at it and say, you know, it's not enough that it's humane 
if we are not thinking about its costs and benefits morally and pragmatically. So the counterfactual is all important here and very hard to imagine. I mean, very hard to to know for sure, as counterfactuals often are. There's no doubt you're clearly right that much of the way that our wars have been conducted in the last 20 years have been self-defeating, have created enemies where we didn't have them, were enormously expensive and failed by under any number of criteria on the one hand. (laughs) On the other hand, no matter what the cause, whether the United States is responsible for this or not, every president since 9-11 has believed, and Obama, as you say, he really wanted to end the war on terror. He wanted to pull it back. He was deeply torn. And every president, to some extent, I think especially Obama, Trump, and Biden in different ways, wanted to pull back on the war. And yet, they kept bumping up against something. And I think that something was the idea that if the United States wasn't out there meeting these threats in some way, that at least maybe from a kind of self-interested U.S. perspective, things were going to go worse. So how do you know? And that's and that's the everyday concern that a president has. And a president, we don't know what threats the president sees. We don't know the threats the United States has, has stopped. How do you know what the right counterfactual is? How do you know that that things wouldn't get worse? Maybe we're settling in, I'm just asking, on an equilibrium of super light footprint warfare that is the least bad of all possible worlds. Highly humane, targeted, limited, but persistent. And how do we know? And again, you can criticize me for taking into account just the U.S. interest, and that's all I'm doing now by hypothesis. But from the president's perspective, how do we know that this is not the least bad of all possible worlds, humane war as it's developed? Well, so by Americanizing, we've stacked the deck in a certain way because we've bracketed, you know, what what's my main concern, especially in an era where America is in decline and yet setting examples for our successors amongst great powers, namely, you know, what what are the rules and expectations? Do we want universal snooping? Do we want, you know, machines buzzing overhead as normalcy, even though we were able to do it, you know, across global hierarchy first? Is that a practice that, you know, sounds like it's one that we would accept if it were done to us? I think if you do go out empirically and, and ask lots of people in the world, the answer to that's pretty clear. I agree with you that from the perspective of the American president, all that's irrelevant. And it clearly mattered to Barack Obama, especially after the underwear bomb threat, that he was absolutely petrified that there'd be even one, you know, one episode where he would be blamed by Dick Cheney and others as he was from the very beginning of his administration for not taking terrorism seriously enough. And again, the the consciousness of what happened to George McGovern is so deeply branded in the psyches of Democrats, even today. Sam, explain what that means. Just that, you know, Democrats learned in the 70s that flirting with restraint leads to electoral disaster because that George McGovern did he said, come home, America. He was like the last representative of American Christian isolationism, if we want to use that term, and he paid. And as a result, Democrats have have always been haunted by what would happen if they didn't seem tough enough. And so I get all that. But, you know, there is this policy question, you know, Obama also said at the you know absolutely brilliant National Defense University address when I narrate he had to face down Medea Benjamin a peace activist he said that that kind of permanent security achieved through you know light and no footprint war is something that's scary it has implications not just for our standing in the world but also for our self-governance at home. Obama said that. And so it's very difficult for me to prove that there could be a different equilibrium. But if we start from the premise that most wars 
you know, essentially in our lifetimes have made the world worse and America worse, I think, you know, we could maybe start with the expectation that this one deserves a little more skepticism and not you know, impose on on people like me the burden of showing that there's some better equilibrium that we can attain right away. I don't want to deny, by the way, that there's a terrorist threat, but a politician who went back to America's peace traditions and restraint traditions would have to say things like, you don't like the world we've made. You're going to get it too as America declines and can't kind of set unilateral terms with surveillance and violence when necessary. Above all, it's worth tolerating a little risk in order to do other things than wage perpetual war. And I, I think there's a case to be made that we can actually get a better outcome. Can I prove it? No. Can I raise the suspicion that we can, given how disastrously we've done lately? I believe so. But let, let's go back to Obama, because I think that his two minds on this, which you brilliantly track in the book, his two minds on this kind of exemplify the paradox or difficulty we're in, because he he really understood the costs abroad and the costs at home to what we're doing. He articulated them. He was pretty upfront about it. At the same time, he couldn't do anything about it. Right. I think he believed, and and you can call it the McGovern syndrome, but you could also call it the risk averse populace. I mean, yes. you know, that this is a democratic thing. This is a this is a response to what the demands of the people are. I mean, Obama worried that the underwear bomber was going to destroy his health care initiative. For and sure. that was explicitly the reason that he ramped up his counterterrorism things at the time. So it strikes me, we've talked about this before, that even if everything you're saying is right, we can't, and we will never know until we try. We can never get there because no president, given the nature of diffuse threats and the nature of technology, no president is ever going to be able to make that move. And if Obama couldn't do it, and indeed, if Obama was the one that, you know, bureaucratized and made permanent this stuff, then no one's going to be able to. We'll get to Biden in a moment, but what, what do you make of that? So I, I think that's, you know, it's a fair hypothesis, but let's consider the alternative, which is not just, you know, shutting down the military. Let's take, you know, our expertise, which is the legal authority for these kinds of things. Well, we know those have been renovated in the last 20 years under the auspices of the War on Terror. Um, whether we're talking about surveillance authority, whether we're talking about war powers. And, you know, there was this incredibly noble moment, however strategic, when Obama basically said, I, I can't go into Syria unless you force me and Congress owns it. You know, I think it would be incredibly noble if that attitude were brought to the kind of ongoing uh, forever war because a president could say, as Joe Biden has been saying lately, it just too partially that I have to respond to the populace by changing the war, not doing self-defeating things, redefining, you know, it. So the objective is more plausible. Why not extend that kind of, you know, education of the American people uh, and dialogue with them to the point that, a president says, I, I'm going to give up this, the kind of unholy arrogation of power you've allowed in my office. If you want to give it back because a terrorist strikes again, or you think that, you know, you want me to fight everywhere and always out of, out of view, then I'll do it. But we ought to have some kind of democratic authorization, even if, you know, our democratic energies in this regard have gotten used to kind of passing the buck and letting the president engage in the kind of calculus you talk about. So I agree that that's a much better world in theory, but there's, that was an amazing moment in the Obama presidency. But I believe he was able to do that because precisely because it was what I would call a humanitarian action in Syria. Right. And it was kind of, forgive me, optional. And it, it was something that 
went beyond strict self-defense, went beyond national security as traditionally defined. In that context, when you know, and Obama had just been through a similar situation in Libya that didn't work out very well. Yes, he he was able to put the onus on Congress, and they they choked. They told him, Congress told him, "Don't ask us. We don't want to be asked." And so he didn't do it. I think it's much harder for presidents to do that in a situation where the nation is threatened. I think the president, for better or worse, has come to be defined as the person responsible for national security. I just think, again, we're in an equilibrium that it's going to be very hard to get out of because when there's a national security setback to the United States, the president is the one deemed responsible. So I I agree with you. I think that would be a better world. I just think it's much, much harder to do and borderline not realistic in the context where we're talking about threats to the nation as opposed to humanitarian interventions. I really like that point. And, you know, again, although I can repeat that if if we start with the premise that things can only get worse, not better, then it's like especially powerful. Witness my critics saying, you know, you must want the world to be worse with more brutal war. I, I think ultimately, you know, this is a long game politics that I'm interested in. And, my, you know, my discussion earlier of how culture brought us here means culture gets us to a different future. And, you know, part of the reason the book's partly subtitled Americans Abandon Peace is because we did have different defaults before a certain point, before we built a militarized warfare state, which was world spanning as of the 40s. No, we're not going to give that up anytime soon. And we'll always find rationales moral or strategic to continue to exercise it as long as it's in people's interests who are powerful. And the president, as you say, quite apart from all of those forces, has electoral pressures to face. I think that culture is an incredibly powerful force, and we can imagine America that demands a different equilibrium, um, partly because it's it doesn't need to dominate militaristically in the way it has, you know, in the name of self-defense but partly because it it just sees other possibilities and wants to try them. That's a tall order. I'm not claiming a book can cue them out or convince anyone, uh, let alone you, that they're they're real. So at the end of the book, in the last chapter, you there's a, I would call it a tinge of optimism. You talk about the Soleimani strike and the reaction to it. A tinge of optimism that maybe the culture is changing. There And you and I have actually written about this together, that mm-hmm. there seems to be evidence However, you know, unreliable, I mean, there seems to be evidence in what people say and in some votes that Congress has taken that the American people and members of Congress on the left and the right are are moving against the perpetual war, are moving against perpetual militarization, are moving against to global, global militarism. And I want you to talk about what the evidence for that is and whether you think that's happening or whether it's wishful thinking on your part and my part when we wrote together. And also, how do you assess the Biden presidency so far in that dimension? I do think there's there's some mounting evidence, but it's early days. So I think, you know, as in so many other respects, the Trump presidency was catalytic. Now, part of the reason is because he saw in the way that Obama had against Hillary Clinton that at least some anti-war sentiment is out there, not just for the sake of, of staying in power, but for getting it, you know, and, and he was the second of three presidents in a row who, you know, complained about American militarism out of the recognition, you know, whatever the beltway may think that these wars are hurting the country. Uh, But it's also the case that a lot of more mainstream types, because they responded with horror to Trump generally, also saw things about the self-defense paradigm we've wrought during the war on terror, essentially because Trump inherited it and operated within it. Now, one thing I do insist in the book, you know, however counterintuitively, is that whatever his own priors Trump was actually forced to operate within the paradigm of endless humane war 
even as he tried to end some wars and even as he tried to restore some brutality to the rest. Now, Biden is a really interesting character because he was able to finish the job of withdrawal from Afghanistan that essentially elites didn't allow Trump to finish. That's really interesting. The the disorderly, you know, uh, withdrawal and the fall of Kabul have have made things difficult for Biden uh, now, but it's it's I think it's it's a testament to the ongoing possibilities of change that he stuck to his not guns but you know withdrawal of guns even so and yet uh, he made very clear in his speeches that uh, he's giving up on counterinsurgent wars, completing the transition that Bush began and preserving counterterrorism. And he was very specific about this when he referred to over the horizon capabilities. That's the shadow war. That's the armed drones, the standoff missiles and special forces that we've allowed to kind of emerge from the war on terror, even as politicians have understood that they need to shut other parts of it down because of electoral and political legitimacy. And so he's in continuity with the story I'm telling. And that means that we're in the early days of a campaign to kind of bring America back to at least some of the anti-war roots, I claim, that were kind of more prominent in its history than in the last 50 years. I would go further and say that the shadow wars, the stealth war, the war at a distance, there's going to be more pressure, more reliance, more developments of those technologies and capabilities and mechanisms as the footprint recedes. And and especially since you know the nature of the withdrawal and the, the clumsy nature of the withdrawal, I think it's fair to say it was clumsy, has heightened the pressure on Biden to you know, be fierce against national security threats. So, you know, it's interesting, Biden, what he did was brave, if not well executed, but I think it could end up making all the trends you're talking about even deeper and more pervasive. I think it could, not least because it provides a credible rationale for it, namely the perception that, you know, Afghanistan with under Taliban rule will once again become a a kind of tinderbox of a, a war on terror, which it was. On the other hand, I think we have to be really vigilant because the first, you know, strike on 9-11, I think, you know, by by great consensus led to enormous mistake. And, you know, we're still paying the price from our overreaction. And I'm just not clear that you know, the second war on terror, which tried to correct some of those mistakes by turning to humanity and surveillance, isn't, you know, just something that, that aside from being, you know, immoral, is something that we'll, we'll see as counterproductive uh, for American interests before too long. I totally agree with you about the short-term calculus. Not only does he need to prove he's tough, you know, that he's not a peacenik, but there are going to be real threats. The question is whether America insists on permanent security as its continuing way of global life uh, for as long as we can see. So on that front, I just think that there's, it's obvious that America will continue to insist on it for the foreseeable future. Americans have been extraordinarily risk averse against security threats at home. And that explains, you know, what Obama did. And I don't think there's, while there's evidence in the culture of growing frustration with endless war and endless military commitment, I don't know if there's any realistic chance or any sense that the kind of culture of risk aversion and insistence on absolute security or, you know, of absor- of imposing and absorbing costs on other dimensions to maintain that security. Do you really think that's changed at all? You know, I, I do, at least to the extent that there's more and more consciousness that a fear of, of threat has been overblown generally with dreadful consequences. Now, that doesn't mean I'd bet on any change. You know, what counts as realistic 
is going to be open to lots of debate. And, you know, part of the role for someone like me is to just try to kind of push the envelope on what can be credible, even as others are pushing back and trying to save the kind of achieve form of the war on terror from the wreckage of its more visible form. And so I think, you know, a good way to end it is by saying I wouldn't bet on you know, my hypothesis that we, we could extricate ourselves from the whole thing uh, for all the reasons you cite. But, you know, I'm going to try along with some others who I think are seeing the light to see whether we can hew out a space for exactly that choice. Let me ask you one final question that builds on that. It's a question I had about the book. So the book is infused, I think, with a, a pacifist sentiment. I mean, that opens with Leo Tolstoy. You strike me as someone who's a genuine, genuinely committed to pacifism. And I want to know, A, is that true? And B, what exactly does that entail? Do you, do you believe that war is, can be eliminated? Do you think that states can you know, just eliminate that form of interaction? Is pacifism a kind of instrumental strategy to try to minimize war? What does it mean to be a committed pacifist? So, you know, I say in the book that it's it's an anti-war book, not a pacifist book. And I rebuke Tolstoy for his extremism, you know, in part because I'm not Christian the way he was, at least his interpretation of, you know, the Sermon of the Mount, which forbade violence. You know, people asked him, but you don't mean we can't kill a mosquito. I'm saved from pacifism and can stick with the, I think, more defensible position that every war that I've seen has made America and the world worse. And you don't even need to argue the merits of pacifism to start from that nugget of wisdom and try to figure out how far you ought to take it. And so we can resist the kind of beltway expertise. We can resist the militarist ideologies that have been at the core of both political parties in in my lifetime uh, without saying, you know, in a utopian way that if we just dissolve the military, the world would be better. That seems insane, you know, and that's why I try to favor some of the characters in my book who weren't as radical as Tolstoy because they allowed for self-defense. They didn't wish away evil and violence, but none of that I think, can justify the kind of militarism for which America has come to stand, Uh, not just, you know, for the world, but, you know, to its own citizens. I think we have alternatives that don't force us to give up the idea that force is sometimes required. It's just every time I've been told it is, it's been a raw deal. Very fair and a good place to end. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, Jack. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. This episode's audio engineer was Hamza Shitu of Goat Rodeo. This episode was edited, as always, by Jen Pacha Howell. And the music was performed by Sophia Yan. Be sure to rate and review the Lawfare Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And share the conversation wherever you see fit. And as always, thanks for listening. Acast recommends more podcasts, more episodes, more great shows. Keep listening to hear a new season we recommend. Fish fans are birds of a certain feather. They're not quite deadheads. They're not exactly parrot heads. And they're a far cry from juggalos. Many bands have obsessed and dedicated followers, but only fish has fish heads. Undermine is a podcast narrated by the band's lyricist, Tom Marshall. That's me. And on this season of Undermine, we shine a light on the fish fan that lives down the block. You see them wearing clothes with donut-shaped patterns, and you hear them using strange words. They have their own slang, their own mythology, their own rituals, and their own rules. On this season of Undermine, we dive deeply into a devoted fan base that has spawned a countercultural revolution in your backyard. 
It's Undermine Season 2, this fall. Find us on Acast or wherever you get your podcasts. Presented by Osiris Media. Acast, Acast, Acast recommends. recommends.